Cool. All right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about how we do mu music recommendations at Spotify and how we're starting to experiment with uh, Spark for that purpose. Uh, so I'm a machine learning guy. Uh, I've been at Spotify for about two years now, but uh, prior to that I was working on a PhD in machine learning at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, and I've been working with uh, Hadoop for a while, maybe four or five years, um, but just recently started using Spark, maybe four or five months ago. So I, I first learned about Spark, I think, um, back in 2011 when uh, Matei actually gave a presentation at uh, NIPS Machine Learning Conference. Um, so I played around with it a little bit back then, but never quite got anything to work, and so I abandoned it, and I was like, oh man, this is so hard. Uh, so uh, just recently re-picked it up about four or five months ago. I think they were on like maybe 06 back then, and now we're on, you know, 1.0, and everything's fixed, right? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, what, what do we need recommendations for? So Spotify's music streaming service. Um, basically on-demand music streaming, so you can search for any artist uh, or song or album in our catalog and play it on demand. Uh, so we have uh, lots of different uh, ways of recommending music to users. You know, we have a very large catalog of about uh, 40,000 uh, songs, or I'm sorry, 40 million songs. So how do we uh, sort through all these, uh, this huge catalog and recommend uh, music to our listeners? Uh, so we provide a bunch of different features. We do personalized recommendations. So, you know, based on what you're listening to, we can tell you uh, what you might like to listen to. Uh, we do artist radio, uh, just like Pandora. You know, you'll start an artist radio station or a song radio station, and we'll play music similar to that. Uh, we do related artists, so you can go to an artist page. Here we have the Fleet Foxes artist page up there, and you can see we display uh, other artists that are similar to Fleet Foxes. Um, so all these ways of, of uh, basically allowing our users to discover new music. So how can we actually find recommendations? Well, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I've listed a, a few of them up here. So one thing you can do is you can just you know, manually curate a bunch of stuff. Uh, so this doesn't scale super well, but um, you know, if you're working with a smaller catalog, this is definitely something you can do. Uh, so I listed a few companies up there that are they're taking that approach. Uh, you can also manually tag a bunch of attributes with each of your songs. So this is something that uh, Pandora has been doing with the Music Genome Project uh, for over a decade now. And so they have music experts actually come in and tag all of their catalog with a bunch of attributes, around like 200 attributes. So they'll say, you know, what's the vocal grittiness of this track? Or, you know, does this have a sexy 80s sax solo in the track? And so all these different attributes, and then they can sort through them and uh, do some machine learning on top of that. Uh, so again, that doesn't scale super well either because you need to sit down and have music experts come in and spend a lot of valuable time uh, doing all that manual tagging. So it takes a while. Uh, some other stuff you can do is you can look at the actual audio content or uh, text analysis. So this is something that Echonest uh, uh, does really well, uh, who Spotify uh, recently acquired a few months ago. Um, so Spotify is now doing quite a bit of this. So you can actually look at the audio content, uh, the underlying audio content, or you can do text analysis on music blogs or um, you know, Twitter or other news articles. And uh, you know, news articles that are talking about this artist are also talking about this artist. So there, you know, there's some relation between these artists. So that's something you can do. And then at Spotify, um, what I'm going to be talking about today, what we've historically, uh, the approach we've taken is more along lines of collaborative filtering. Um, and so collaborative filtering is basically uh, looking at what our users are listening to and then analyzing that and finding relationships and then recommending music based on that. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. OK, cool. So um, yeah, so what is collaborative filtering? Again, it's just uh, you know, analyzing what your users have been listening to and finding those relationships. So a lot of people, you know, they hear collaborative filtering, they immediately think of the Netflix prize. Um, it's this million dollar prize that Netflix offered for anyone that can improve um, their recommendations by a certain loss. Um, so here, here's kind of the idea, right? You've got these two guys here, and uh, the first guy's saying, hey, I really like songs P, Q, R, and S. And the other guy's saying, whoa, well, I like you know, Q, R, S, and T. So they share these three songs in common, so they each have one song that the other doesn't know about. So maybe they should each uh, listen to that song. So that's sort of the basic premise. OK, so here, here's uh, uh, one way to sort of formalize this. Um, this, is more, this is called explicit matrix factorization, for anyone who hasn't seen it before. And this is more the Netflix case. So in the Netflix case, you've got a bunch of users and a bunch of movies in their catalog. And those users have rated some subset of the movies. And it's on a one to five star scale. But they haven't rated all the movies, right? And so now the goal is to try to predict 
how, what users are going to rate the movies that they haven't yet rated. Right? And then to recommend new movies to a user, you might try to recommend them the movies that you think they would rate highly. So that's sort of the problem. And uh, formally, uh, here's how you do it. Um, basically, what you try to do is you try to approximate your original ratings matrix by the product of two lower dimensional matrices. So you've got these two lower dimensional matrices up there, X and Y. And uh, by lower dimension, I mean like, uh, you know, let's say you're working with millions of users and millions of movies. Uh, we're going to try to approximate uh, this by the product of uh, two matrices that are rank, let's say, like only 100 dimensions. So that F there is, let's say it's like 100. Um, so basically, we want to learn these factors, 100 dimensional factors associated with each user and each movie in our catalog, uh, such that the product of those two vectors approximates the original ratings matrix, right? And so you can see we've got this loss function up there. This is the uh, root mean squared error. So basically that RUI, that's the, uh, for every rating in our ratings matrix, that's the rating that user U gave to item I, or movie I. And uh, that XU transpose is just the user's vector, 100 dimensional vector. And the YI is the movie's 100 dimensional vector. And so we want the, the dot product of those two vectors to closely approximate the ratings that are in our matrix. Um, and then you've got this regularization term to deal with overfitting. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Um, so in our case, we don't have explicit ratings. We have uh, implicit data. So uh, rather than having users rate songs in our catalog, uh, we try to implicitly infer what users like based on what they're listening to. Uh, so one way to do this uh, that who, who Karen and Valinsky uh, came up with is you basically do the same thing that we did with the explicit case. Uh, but instead of using explicit ratings, let's just use binary. So let's place ones and zeros everywhere. A one anywhere that a user streamed a track, even just once, and a zero everywhere else. And then we're basically going to do that same uh, root mean squared error, but we're going to weight it. And we're going to weight it by some confidence based on the number of times that the user streamed that track. So if they streamed Michael Jackson a thousand times, but they only streamed Daft Punk once, then Michael Jackson's going to count a lot more in that loss function. Uh, so it looks very similar uh, uh, to, to the explicit case. Okay, so how do we actually solve this thing? Um, well, one method, uh, there's actually a lot of methods, um, uh, but one method you can do is the alternating least squares method. So basically how this works is uh, you alternate back and forth and solve a least squares regression. So if you fix uh, the Y matrix, for example, fix all the song vectors, uh, then what does this become? It's just a weighted ridge regression now. And so we can actually solve it. It has a closed form solution even. Um, so you fix the songs, solve for the user vectors, right? There's the closed form and uh, closed form expression. And then once we solve for the user vectors, now fix the user vectors and solve for the song vectors. And uh, we alternate back and forth until we converge. Um, so here's what it looks like. And, and one thing to kind of note here that's, that's kind of cool is that you can basically pull out this X transpose X, which basically means that now uh, to solve for... Uh, in this case, the optimal uh, song vector for a given song, all we need are the ratings associated with uh, only the song, basically only the ratings that the user actually streamed for that song. So we only need the ones that were streamed. We don't need uh, everything. We don't need all the zeros because we factor that out in the X transpose X. Okay, so that's all the math I'm going to do. Uh, so you know, here's here's what alternating least squares looks like in Python. Uh, this is just some some quick code I put up. You can find it on GitHub if you want to. Okay, so first uh, I'm going to talk about how we scaled this up with Hadoop, and then I'm going to go into to how, we, how we do it with Spark. So this was Hadoop at Spotify in 2009. Uh, it was just like, you know, a couple of machines that we had in a break room somewhere. Uh, but this is, this is 2014. So now we've got, uh, you know, 700 nodes in our London data center. Um, so we've advanced quite a bit since then. And we're uh, running a yarn on all this. Okay, so this is sort of uh, how you do uh, matrix factorization with Hadoop. So this complicated diagram here that we have is basically the ratings matrix, and I've blocked it off by a bunch of blocks. I call this the full gridify method. That's kind of my own little phrase for it. But basically what we do is uh, block everything off into all these blocks, and now each block only refers to a subset of users and songs, right? And so, we, like, for example, the first block in the upper left corner is all the users that uh, mod with K, where K is some... Uh, it's like the number of rows, right? 
K is the number of rows, L is the number of columns. So all the users mod K equal to zero, and all the items mod L equal to zero, put those ratings in that block, right? And so now, in the map phase, basically, you can take all the ratings associated with each block, only get, uh, so for solving for users, only get the item vectors associated with that block. So you don't need all the item vectors. You only need the ones for that block. And you aggregate a bunch of terms. And then the reduce phase, you sum up all those terms, and you can solve for the optimal user vectors. So that's sort of the idea there. Um, so this is just showing it uh, a little bit better. Uh, so we basically use distributed cache in order to send the vectors that that block needs. Okay, so that worked pretty well for us for the most part. You know, we've been doing that for you know a little over three years now. Um, but what's the big problem with this? Well, you know, each at each phase, right? This is an iterative algorithm. Each time we want to perform an iteration, we need to perform another Hadoop job, right? So we're continually reading and writing from disk. So you know this is this is sort of the big no-no, and this is why uh, you know why Spark is so great. So we've got this big I/O bottleneck, right? Okay, so that's where Spark comes in. Um, is really nice is that you know we can load the ratings matrix into memory, and we don't have to keep uh, rereading it from disk every iteration, right? We can load it into memory, cache it, and then uh, we can join things to where the ratings are cached, and uh, just keep performing our iterations. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, how you do that. Okay, so this, this was our first attempt. Um, so our first attempt was uh, basically, let's just broadcast everything. Um, so what you do is uh, you've got all your ratings matrix there. And uh, first we're gonna compute the Y transpose Y, right? So take all the item vectors, uh, transpose with themselves, take the dot product, and uh, you only need to do that once. Right, for each iteration. And now broadcast all the item vectors. I'm sorry, first uh, broadcast Y transpose Y. Uh, now let's broadcast all the item vectors, right? So every partition is gonna get a full set of item vectors. And now let's group all the ratings by user. And then solve for the optimal user vectors, right? Because we've got all the item vectors and that's all we need. All you need is the item vectors and Y transpose Y and you can solve for the optimal user vector. Uh, so here's what it looks like in code. And uh, so what's, what's sort of the problem with this? Does anyone see it? Well, one thing is that we're unnecessarily shuffling data around each iteration, right? Because we're just grouping the ratings together, but we're never caching anything, right? So we're basically doing a lot of shuffling over the wire that we don't necessarily need to do. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we're sending a full copy of all the item vectors to every single worker. So maybe we can think of ways to get around having to do that. Okay, so this is the second attempt. And this looks a lot more like what we did with Hadoop, right? I've now blocked the ratings matrix into a bunch of blocks. And again, this is, the, this is what I call the full gridify method. Okay, so let's group the ratings into a bunch of K by L partitions, and let's cache them. Okay, so we send all our ratings around, we partition them by the block. Uh, ID, and then uh, cache them, and we're gonna leave them there, and they're never gonna move. Okay, next, we're gonna compute Y transpose Y and broadcast it. Uh, remember, if we're using a, a, a dimension of 100, for example, for our vectors, this is just a 100 by 100 matrix, so it's pretty small. So we'll just broadcast that everywhere. Um, and now for each item vector, we're gonna figure out which block needs the item vector, right? And we're gonna send a copy of that item vector to the block. Okay, so we do that. So each block only requires a subset of the item vectors, right? So we're not having to send uh, all the item vectors to every partition, so that's kind of nice. Um, so now we compute all the intermediate terms, and uh, now we're gonna have to shuffle them around to group by the user. So we've got this extra shuffle phase here. So we are shuffling quite a bit. Um, and then we aggregate and solve for the optimal user vectors. So here's what that looks like in code. Uh, Right, so you've got here, you compute Y transpose Y, um, you join the vectors with the ratings, and then you aggregate the terms and solve. Um, so how'd this one do? So it's got some pros and some cons to it. Uh, the pros are that uh, the ratings, uh, we're caching the ratings now, and so we're never shuffling the ratings around, which is nice because that's the bulk of our data, is the ratings. 
Um, another benefit is that each partition only requires a small subset of the item vectors or user vectors if you're solving for items uh, in memory at each iteration. So that's pretty nice. Um, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go over uh, the half gridify method in a second, and this potentially requires less local memory than half gridify. Um, so I'll talk about that when we go over half gridify. So some of the cons, though, uh, we're sending a lot of intermediate data uh, over the wire each iteration, because each of these blocks, if we go back, yeah, so each of these blocks uh, basically needs to uh, aggregate a bunch of uh, terms, but then we need to sum those terms, we need to group by the user and sum those terms up. So in order to do that, we've got this phase of shuffling stuff around where we're grouping by user. Um, so maybe there's a way to avoid that. So that's sort of a con to it. Okay, so here's, here's the third attempt. And this is what I'm calling the half gridify method. And this is actually, if you go into um, uh, MLlib, which is, uh, you know, uh, packaged with Spark. Uh, they have their own ALS implementation, and this is the method that ML, uh, this is the method that MLlib uses, is the half gridify. So how you do half gridify is you basically partition your ratings matrix into K user rows and uh, item uh, columns, uh, but rather than block it uh, into the full blocks, we're going to have all of the ratings for a user are in the same block, right? So we've got blocks, but all the ratings for a given user are in the same block. And so that's gonna help us cut down on that shuffle phase of where we needed to you know, group by the user and aggregate all those terms together. Uh, so again, uh, first thing we do is uh, partition the ratings matrix by our, our blocks. So we do that, cache it, and now that's it there. And uh, now we compute Y transpose Y, broadcast it. Uh, then we're gonna send only the item vectors that each block needs. Now, one thing to realize here, though, is that you could potentially require all of the item vectors on your partition. And the reason for that is that we have every single rating associated with a user for a given user is in the same block now. So let's say a user, or let's say we have like 100,000 users in one block, right? Um, it's, you know, you have the potential that those 100,000 users have listened to almost every track in the catalog uh, cumulatively. Um, and so in that case, you would require every single item vector at that partition. Um, so that's something you didn't have with the full gridify method. So that's just one, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you can't fit all of your item vectors or all of your user vectors in memory, then you know, maybe uh, this method uh, has some limitations. Okay, cool. So we, uh, we, yeah, we send the item vectors that we need, uh, and then now we don't have that extra shuffle phase, right? We've got all the item vectors we need, so we can actually solve for the user vectors right there on the partition. Um, so, we, you know, we cut down on a lot of that shuffling. Uh, so, yeah, note that we removed the extra shuffle. Okay, so here's what it looks like in code. This is actually uh, code taken directly um, out of MLlib. Uh, so, here's some of the pros and cons. Uh, again, you know, we're caching the ratings and we're not shuffling them around. They get cached and they sit there. And then uh, another thing is that uh, once item vectors are joined with the ratings, we don't need to shuffle them around. So, that's, that's a really nice benefit. Um, the cons is that, again, each partition could potentially require a full copy of each item vector, which may not all fit into memory. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. And, uh, you know, that potentially requires more local space than full gridified because of that. Okay, so here's some running times. So, so here, here's what we ran with. Uh, so this data set that, uh, for these numbers was about 4 million users and about 500,000 artists. Um, and so it's the full data set of what those four million users listen to. Every single track they listen to, how many times did they listen to it. Um, so all these jobs were running using uh, 40 latent factors, and uh, the Spark jobs used uh, 200 executors with 20 gig containers, and uh, the Hadoop job was using 1,000 mappers and 300 reducers. Uh, so there's some numbers. Uh, we can see that the, the half gridify method was actually the fastest, and it's probably because you know, we're not sending all that uh, data across the wire. Uh, so here's, here's a slide I stole from uh, Chang Ru's slides uh, that basically shows, um, you know, some ALS running times that, that he ran with. Uh, so it shows, you know, performance against uh, some other implementations in Mahouts and GraphLab. Um, so one thing to note that's kind of nice is, you know, it, it's, it's comparable to, to GraphLab, but uh, you've got, you know, around, you know, an order of like 10x um, speed up against uh, 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 Hadoop in the Mahout. So that's kind of nice. 
Okay, so here's a bunch of random learnings for anyone who's just getting started with Spark and some of the things that we had to figure out. Um, so one thing, if, if you haven't seen the pair RDD functions in, uh, in Spark, this is something definitely to check out because this is sort of how, you, how I feel like we do everything. Uh, so sort of the idea is to basically split all your data up into key value pairs. So maybe you know, we want to join everything associated with a user. So we've got some ratings associated with the user and then some vectors associated with the user. So how do you join those? Well, basically make, make all your data to be RDDs of key value pairs. And now you've got all these functions, these pair RDD functions you can use. So you can group by key and give it a partitioner and it'll basically group everything and make sure it all ends up on the same partitioner so then you can do work just on that single node. Um, so that's sort of like a best practice kind of thing. Uh, so I definitely recommend uh, checking out pair RDD functions if you haven't seen that. Um, another random learning. Uh, we had a lot of issues with uh, cryo serialization. So cryo uh, uh, serialization is much faster than Java serialization, so I definitely recommend using it. But it often requires you to write and or register your own serializers. So originally when we went to use the MLib uh, ALS codes, we ran into this issue where um, the mutable bit set in ALS uh, is, isn't serializable with uh, cryo serializer cryo serializer, uh, so we had to go and uh, register that ourselves. Um, so we, uh, we actually had to go in and um, write our own serializer and, and register that. Uh, so that was, that was kind of an issue. Um, it should be fixed with the next iteration of Twitter Chill. Uh, we also uh, ran into the same problem with uh, Breeze. So Breeze is like, a, it's a numerics package for Scala, similar to NumPy that we were using, and uh, Dense Vector had some issues where I think in uh, 07 it had uh, basically a recursive reference, and so when you had reference tracking turned off, which speeds things up, which we did, uh, we ended up with these stack overflow errors, and we we're like, whoa, what's going on? Why are we getting stack overflow? Um, and so that's why, and so uh, basically uh, we, we had to write our own serializer for that too. Uh, I think the issue is fixed in 08, actually. Um, so here's another random learning, is that uh, we haven't actually been able to, to run um, these jobs on our full data set. Uh, so we've been running into a lot of issues with failed executors, and the jobs haven't fully recovered from that. So oftentimes, you know, we, we can run with about 20% uh, of our full data set, and going beyond 20%, we start getting all these failed uh, executors. And so you find all these cannot find address in your, in your job tracker. Um, so that's an issue we've been dealing with, that we, you know, we spend a lot of our time trying to tune things, and um, so hopefully we can figure that out. Uh, and that's it. We do actually have time for a couple of questions. Hi, did I see correctly that Graph Lab ran faster than Spark for this application? Yeah, that's right. Gra Graph Lab is like very low level optimized for for that sort of uh, an algorithm, so I think you know that's that's why you're, you're going to see that. But I think it's a little less general purpose. Um, so yeah, so Graph Lab, yes, it did perform better. And those are those are not my slides. That was uh, taken from Shangru, uh, one of the DataStacks guys, Any or sorry, Databricks. Sorry, can you hold the mic closer? I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry. Any insight you can provide to the Spark developers in terms of how to improve the performance based on what you saw with Graph Lab? Um, not really, no. I, I don't really know much about Graph Lab, so I, I don't have any insight into what Graph Lab is actually doing under the covers. Two more questions. Getting back to your last point you made about failed executors, it sounds like it's not usable then for your data sets until this resolves. And Exactly. Yeah. So this is an issue we've been we've been you know playing around with tuning. So there's lots of different you know things you got in your Spark configuration that you can tune, you know JVM heap spaces and other things. And and so you know we spent a lot of our time just tuning. So it'd be nice to be able to get these things to run without having to sit in there and do a lot of tuning. So how long have you been working on that particular problem? Uh, off and on for a few months. Not 100% of my time though. Yeah, so this isn't in production yet. We're still using Hadoop in production, exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank Chris again.
All right, let's see what you got. It should be your light bulb. It's a key? Yeah. Cool. Are we using the clicker? Um, I can use the clicker. I mean, are you gonna, is the laptop going to be up here? I can yeah, just it'll be right here. I can just arrow on. Yeah, sure. That's fine. 